Your source for everything paranormal. Para-X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Merry meet and merry part, bright the cheeks and warm the heart. So tread the circle thrice about to keep unwelcome spirits out. Bide within the law you must, in perfect love and perfect trust. Mind the threefold laws you should, three times bad and three times good. These eight words the read fulfill, and ye harm none to what ye will. Welcome to Stirring the Cauldron. Now, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Hey, Mary Meet, everybody, and welcome to Stirring the Cauldron. My guest tonight is Irene Glass, who, along with Kane Dreamwalker, uh, wrote a really interesting book that we're going to be talking about. It's called Magpie Training, the Black, Black Feather Mystery School. Now, Irene identifies within the diverse umbrella of paganism as a mystic witch. Um, she's also a musician who writes and performs with Kindred Crow, which is a pagan folk project. She's a former Marine a cur- and currently a yoga teacher, a tarot reader, and a pagan religious professional. She's been practicing witchcraft for over 20 years, and like many in the pagan world, her personal practice is a self-constructed trial and error and amalgamation of techniques, beliefs, and traditions cobbled together from many different sources. And I think those of you who are, we all know that just about the way we do it. Um, questions and comments are welcome for those listening live in the chat room, and anyone outside the chat room is more than welcome to pop over to paraxradionetwork.com and join us. And all that being said, um, Irene, I'm so glad to have you with us tonight. Thank you so much for having me on, Marla. It's a good book. Uh, <laughs> I'm so glad you like it. <laughs> I did. and I. But I think we, we should probably start with the basics. Um, introduce us to the Black Feather Mystery School and how did it come about, all that good stuff. Absolutely. I'd be happy to. Black Feather Mystery School is largely the school I wish I'd gone to. <laughs> um, it occurred to me as a, I guess we could say a charge from the gods at first. I am largely heathen, and one of the religious forms I practice within my heathenry is a kind of divination called Sather, where a seer is uh, engages in transpossessory work with a god or a power from the heathen pantheon. And I was in a Sather ritual, and the seers in the chairs were uh, aspecting as the Norns, which are a little bit like the Greek fates, so one for the past, one for the present, and one for the future. And so I asked the Norn of the future what I should do to continue to protect my community. I'm a community leader uh, here in Western Maryland. And the answer I got was teach, make them like you. Mm. And, you know, <laughs> when you're talking to to a person who has that kind of power passing through them, you don't really ask a lot of questions. You just, thank you very much, kind of back away because it's a very intense, intense situation. Mm-hmm. So I sat for a while. It took me almost a year before the idea for the school really crystallized because, of course, those simple words, there's a lot contained in there, you know, make them like you. Well, what kind of a witch am I? I I've <laughs> taught witchcraft for years, but always based out of the structures that I've learned, right? I, I taught within my tradition for a long time, and then when I left my tradition, I taught what we could basically describe as eclectic witchcraft. So mm-hmm. then I had to really sit down and go, all right, well, what do I do well? And if I was going to make a witch like me and have it not take 20 years of randomly running into different trainings and falling <laughs> backwards into practices and <laughs> stumbling into wonderful conferences, if I did it on purpose, what would that look like? And mm-hmm. Black Feather Mystery School is the outgrowth of that. The vision came very suddenly um, I was walking my dogs, you know, and all of a sudden <laughs> the whole thing was in my head, the entire school, the book, um, the third thread that I want to weave into the Black Feather system are retreats where we're able to get together for like a long weekend. Um, but 
the the entire thing just materialized and it was always designed to be both an in-person series and then a book for people who lived further afield. So the in-person series began three years ago. So the very first Magpie training ran in 2019 and was taught to a group of about, it was about 60 that, that completed mm. the training. Uh, we're really fortunate here in Western Maryland. We have a large and thriving pagan community. It is an extraordinary blessing to have that many people of like mind around us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm really spoiled in that I'm a, um, I'm actually, <laughs> my commissioning ceremony for my uh, my congregation is this upcoming Sunday. I'm a commissioned minister with a Unitarian congregation, which means I have access to a large space. And this is an advantage as well. You know, I, I still remember the, the world of paganism I came up in, right, where we all met in people's living rooms and in the, <laughs> the back shop of the New Age store and the library. So, you know, the privilege of space and then density of community means that we do have a large community. So the... The first year was taught to, again, that group of 60 completed it. Uh, And then when the pandemic hit, I had all of my class notes. And I, after every class, I would go through and I would amend them with any questions that were asked so that when I went back to turn them into a book, it was always my intention to do so. I would have a really good uh, set of material because it's been field tested, right? It's been run through mm-hmm. different people. It's uh, <laughs> There's nothing like students to shoot holes in something, right? That's one of the <laughs> best things about teaching material. So uh, the pandemic hit and I am a community servant. I am an extrovert. I'm a musician and a teacher. Obviously, I need to be around people and I was not in good shape when the pandemic hit and a very dear friend basically challenged me to write the book. And oh. And so uh, we, I built a plan and, and I, you know, I took all of the notes and I put them together and, and made the book. I expanded it. We, I changed things so that they would work for a distance learning format. Um, but it was my big pandemic project. And, and now here is the second thread of the, the three strands that I saw in that vision finally come to be. Yeah. And OK, so this is the fir- the magpie level is the first level. That's correct. And there's a supplemental online training course, which you're going to be announcing soon, I think. Um, yes. And then, so how many levels will there be, and will you be doing a book for each level as well? So there are going to be four levels. Um, Rook and Crow have already run. We just wrapped up Crow uh, this past summer, or this past early spring, really. Uh, I think we ended in March. And then Raven, which is the fourth level, will be starting in September. Um, my uh, Kane, my co-author and co-teacher, and I just sat down and actually nailed down the schedule for the entire thing, so that'll be going up online soon. There will be books for Crow and for Rook. Raven level, unfortunately, contains material that I don't feel safe teaching in a distance form. Format. There are some kinds of magic that just, you really have to have, uh, I'm going to use the phrase of grown up in the room, you know, yeah, uh-huh. it's, you, you have to learn <laughs> from someone who can manage any variables that come up. Uh, and that yeah. is particularly true for some of the, the deep spirit work that both Kane and I engage in and, and want to teach our students. It's just not stuff for a book. It's not something you want someone doing all by themselves without the ability to ask for help. Yeah, or untanglement. Yeah, okay. Right, exactly. <laughs> yes. You know, I mean, some people don't don't understand that it's not all, you know, rhyming uh, spells and, you know, lighting a candle and all that. I mean, it's exactly. deeper and deeper and deeper. And, you know, I like what you said um, about Blackfeather that, again, um, that it threads the needle between structure of traditional witchcraft and freedom of mysticism. And on your website, you identify yourself as a mystic witch. And for those who might not be familiar with the term, what's a mystic witch? A mystic witch is a practitioner of witchcraft who uses their art and practice to seek out mystical and transcendental experiences. So I am a journey worker and a traveler and a, oh gosh, an experiences outside consensus reality haver. Uh, That is the the shining fluid that fills my veins um, and that really animates my practice. I am a huge proponent of co-creative relationships with spirits, the small ones around you in the earth around your home and the big ones, the gods we serve. And my approach to that is, uh, is intuitive and is very based around journey work and, and deliberate cultivation of mystical experiences. Mm-hmm. 
And and also, um, the book, okay, grew out of the school, and, you know, it teaches witchcraft in conjunction with spirit work with a heavy focus on empowerment yes. and sovereignty. You want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm a former Marine, um, and... When I was in the Marine Corps, women made up less than 3% of it. I believe the percentage is slightly higher now. I have, when I was examining myself in terms of what kind of a witch am I, the fact that one of my strongest advantages is that I am very confident. I'm very strong. I, uh, I try things, and I know that I can get myself out of whatever I've gotten myself into. I trust me, mm-hmm. and I wanted to find a way to give that to other people. You know, I still wrestle with the same self worth issues that almost all of us do as a you know, sort of a, a product of the culture that we are in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But comparatively speaking, to most practitioners I know, I'm just a lot more confident, and I wanted to be able to inspire that in my students. And then there's also the larger wave of the fact that it is simply needed. You know, the world needs more witches right now. Uh, Everything's kind of going to hell in a handbasket around us, Uh and we need strong, empowered, sensible, you know, powerful witches to come and help. So the more of those I can help turn loose into the world, the more I feel like I'm doing my job. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's true. And, you know, I don't know anybody that is 100% sure of themselves and, and, does things with not that little niggle of doubt in the back of their heads. And right, doubt is good. Doubt is that doubt is your your brain working. You know, it's just you can't let it stop you all the time. Well, and it does. You know, it trips you up, yeah. or somebody will say something. You know, off key or, or or not even meant to be bad, but you take it that way. You know, I mean, there's always I don't know. I hate to say it this way, but there's always a teeny little victim that lives in each of us. Yes. Yes, and I agree. And we can't let that happen. I mean, you know, you can't live your life if you're always going to be doubting what you're doing or thinking that you're thinking the wrong thing or, or whatever. So, you know, this thing, this heavy focus um, on empowerment in the book, I think, is really, really important. Well, and it's it's also just a simple sort of math problem when it comes to the magic that we do. If part of you is always trying to f- not to fail, but is so afraid that it won't even open the door to wonder, how effective are your spells, really? You know, mm-hmm. like when we don't believe in ourselves, so, you know, if we're going to count it as spell points and you're putting 10 spell points toward a, a particular working, but then you're pulling three of them away. Mm -hmm. simply from your own self-doubt or your own fear, this is no longer as effective a working as it could be, as if you really understood and believed in in your own capability. Um, So, it, you know, some of it is also just legitimately, here's how good magic works. You have to trust yourself. You know, it's one of the best things about witches is that we can trust ourselves. Well, we can, but we need to. um, And you get, you know, um, know that we can. That is important, too. But I know I, a long time ago, learned that I did a half-assed spell you know i wasn't yes. sure of it and um i couldn't figure out why it wasn't working you know and i sat there for a while because it was something that was going to happen sooner i mean i needed something to happen within an hour or something you know one of those things sure. communication spell kind of thing who i needed to get in touch with somebody and you know i sat there and i sat there and then all of a sudden you know the the little light bulb went in over my head and said Yeah, you've been doubting it. You're still doubting it. Well, no wonder it didn't work, you idiot. You know, and (laughs) and there we go. And so, you know, you have to, in life, not just in spells, you have to be sure of what you're saying and doing because the doubt will make you trip and fall. Yes, it really will. And it keeps people from, from living as fully as they could. I my own experience um, and my own life, I I ended up married to absolutely the wrong partner for me. And I found that being in, you know, an environment where I was dealing with someone who had some really maladaptive coping techniques made me less, I was not alive anymore. I was just Mm -hmm. going through the motions. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean, Marla? Like I I was just day to day. I wasn't actually alive. And I think that we can end up in that situation, not necessarily with a partner, but with various life situations. Mm -hmm. It's part of why we teach life sculpting in the first level of Black Feather. We need to get everybody realigned so that they wake up. Many of us are just anesthetizing ourselves as soon as we get off of work with whatever, whether it's social media or drugs or alcohol. And then we wake up and we go to work and we do the whole thing again. 
again and we're never actually alive. And, mm-hmm. and the beauty, oh my gosh, the beauty of paganism and witchcraft is this vibrant life that it brings to you. And, mm-hmm. and so many of us are just not tapping into that. And so, you know, we build it into the school as much as we could. Yeah, and it's hard to get it back if you lose it. I mean, I went through the same thing that you did um, for a long time and going through the motions and and whatever. And it took a long time after leaving to kind of get my head back in the right place because it it was just, it was like a a psychic vampire. It sucks all the energy out of you. It sucks all the happiness, you know, like a Dementor, Harry Potter. Yes, yes. It doesn't. I mean, you work, you do what you need to do, you go whatever, but... Yeah, you're you're just kind of a walking zombie. Yeah. So yeah, so this is really important, and I think um, also it's important to mention that the focus of this book on developing you know practical skill and approaches to spell work and rituals makes it accessible regardless of whatever path we practice, and it's not only for beginners; it's also for those who are ready who already are on the path. And I think you know that. Because some people might be listening and say, well, I don't fit in there. Well, no, everybody does. There's so much in there that is useful for filling little gaps. Like one of the funny things that most of us say during my uh, during the um, introduction that you did, you mentioned that, of course, I have a cobbled together system. Most of us do, which means there are these exciting spaces where we can learn something new. Uh, and I like to think that Blackfeather offers a, a really nice system that can sometimes fill in some of those spaces. Plus, you know, I always learn something, even when I go to a beginner witchcraft class. Um, I sit on the board of Sacred Space Conference, which means I go to a lot of classes at the conference. And even mm-hmm. if it's a subject I think I know, I always learn something. Like, it's it's one of those things where anybody who has really put their heart and their soul into what they are teaching, you're definitely going to get something of value out of that. And mm-hmm. then I think the other thing that makes Blackfeather a little bit different is that we teach spirit work concurrently with witchcraft, just because it's a really useful system. And mm-hmm. a lot of people who grew up Wiccan the way I did, spirit mm-hmm. work was a late addition for me and it's just such a wonderful tool set that i think more witches should have access to mm-hmm. yeah absolutely um got a quick question from the chat room um how did you grow confident as a teacher and as a speaker practice really and some of it also I do have an unfair advantage I come from a weirdo theater family I don't (laughs) actually remember the first time I was on stage because I was too little Um, I think I was like five or six the first time I danced in a ballet in front of an audience so I've been on stage my my basically my whole life but I had very bad stage fright until I got out of the Marine Corps it, it's odd but you know <laughs> there's nothing quite like Marine Corps boot camp to make you trust yourself <laughs> so, <laughs> what else? really like it's, <laughs> trust yourself or don't make it those are your choices um, mm-hmm. so that helped a lot and then I always joke about this I say you just have to give yourself Stockholm syndrome but the truth of the matter is that by continuous exposure, we really do begin to adapt to stressful situations in a different way. So the first band that I was in as an adult and singing lead, I would perform with my eyes closed because I was so afraid, you know? Mm -hmm. And now, of course, you know, nearly 20 years later when I'm performing with Kindred Crow, I look people in the eye. I deliberately invite, um, I guess we could call it fairly intense contact with the audience. Mm -hmm. So there's that performer thread and how that developed. And then as far as teaching goes, I just, I love to teach. I'm a third generation teacher. This is what my family does. Um, We love sharing information. So it's less scary for me when I'm teaching something I really enjoy that I want other people to learn. Um, That thing when someone learns something and there's that light that comes on inside them, that is the most addictive thing in the world to be able to foster that moment in another person. (laughs) So that helps a lot and that I think when you know you're serving a higher purpose of some sort, it does make it less scary. So I think, yeah, a combination of practice and then, um, and then following your own thread. Uh, it's really, it, it's what worked for me at least. <laughs> well, and yeah, and it should work for everybody. Um, slowly. I mean, it's not going to happen overnight, obviously, oh, indeed. But, but you just take it step by step and each step is a milestone. And, and with each milestone comes a little bit more confidence. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
Right. Well, and that's some of the learning to trust yourself. You know, this this applies yeah. to magic as well. Right? We all start with a little spell, you know, our first candle magic spell, and then it works. So then we become a little <laughs> more confident. And then we try a bigger spell, and maybe we'll try a big ritual next. It, it's a very mm-hmm. similar trajectory. Yeah, and and people shouldn't be afraid, you know, because some people are, have always been brought up saying well you're not good enough you're not smart enough you're not this and that people have to really stop listening to outsiders yes you know i mean because you take it personally and and then you know you just shoot yourself in the foot so yeah i mean it's not impossible and reading this book and going through this empowerment and learning very important really important and not even if you're not a witch i mean just in general um you know, it it, it, works, it works in that way, too. Yes, agreed. I would say that some of the material around life sculpting is less magical and more just life stuff. It's how to mm-hmm. how to align to your, your, your own true north. And that's not limited to witchcraft at all. That's just all of us. <laughs> See, so it's a book for everybody. <laughs> I don't have to think so. Yeah, <laughs> it is my go. hope that it is for everybody. <laughs> Well, you know, you mentioned that in writing the book, you were in, you're introducing um, the skills that you most would have liked to have when you were younger. Yes. Um, and and I, I agree with that, too. Information wasn't always available. Um, and it would have made things a, lo- a lot easier along the way if we had known some of those things. And I'm hearing that from so many authors lately that they write books and the reason for it is for the same reason. You know, they wished they had that in hand when they needed it. Oh, yes. So, I wish I could send this back to my 15-year-old self, you know. The books that were available in the late 80s and early 90s were wonderful for their time period, but they were yeah. not what we have now. No, and do you think that there was always, well, there always has been a stigma attached to freely giving out this kind of information, especially yes. years ago. But now the walls have come down a little bit, and people feel easier to share uh, to share information without repercussions. Um, so you know, I guess maybe those of us who aren't privy to all the good stuff that's out there now learned, and maybe we are the teachers, you know, for yes. the next generation. <laughs> so I mean, you know, all of a sudden there goes the other light bulb. Um, yeah. <laughs> But, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really more and more people, you know, when I say, well, what's the genesis of your book? You know, well, this happened to me or it didn't happen to me, and, and I wanted to help other people. And, and well, that's what we do anyway. Yes. We're, we're the wise women. We help. Right. <laughs> and the men. Yes. Don't forget it's our the men. Natural, our natural predisposition. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, all right. So the foundation of the book is about developing techniques that come from witchcraft and Wicca and spirit work and personal experience and gnosis, um, which in some cases people don't know that term, but it's the knowledge of spiritual mysteries. Um, and one of the first things in getting started in magpie training in the book is that you suggest that people create a dedicated space to work in and build a black feather altar. Well, let's talk about that. Everybody knows me, and they're going, oh, God, she's on an altar kick again. But I really (laughs) do believe in altars. I think they're really important. And so talk about a black feather altar and um absolutely yeah so this ties back very well to our conversation about empowerment the very first altar you build in black feather is a space where you will work your magic but it is an altar to you so the black feather altar contains a mirror um and one that you do a self-blessing into every single day um from my own experience, there is no substitution or magic bullet that takes the place of regular practice. What we what we feed increases, and altars give us the space to do that. They encourage a place that is sacred, that is just for spiritual connection, that is just for the study of magic, and the Black Feather Altar specifically really starts building in the foundations of the practice. Um, I find that having, you know, I have like five or six altars at my house at this point in time, but like, <laughs> I find that they're very important, you know, so I, I live in a very old farmhouse. I have an altar for the spirits of place here. I have an altar for my own ancestors. I have an altar for my gods, and then I have my working Black Feather Altar. This is where my magic goes. 
and it's where my mirror lives, you know, which I use regularly. I, I still do this, the daily self blessing. Mm-hmm. It's important that we that we connect with our divine selves uh, as part of the foundations of our practice. So that is that is where the black feather altar begins. Um, a couple of the other items on it, we have a you know a, a scarf of some sort to cover the mirror when it's not in use. We use black feather oils or just an oil blend that helps you connect to your spirituality. There are some recommended recipes in the book, but really I just want people to choose something that then builds in an olfactory trigger for, ah, it is witchcraft time. And it really helps us gear shift out of like day-to-day sort of um, mindset, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's on the altar. And one of the other big things is a stone (laughs) and a bowl of salt. So every time you sit down to study, to do work, you take a moment and channel into that rock, whatever you're carrying with you that could be distracting, and you put it in the bowl of salt. (laughs) And then that lets you have a little more focus for the work at hand. I like that. I didn't think about that. Um, You know, and there, there are people that don't know what to do with an altar. Okay, so they build one. Right. But then they don't know, okay, I have it there. Now, all right, so with my ancestor altar, and and it's a personal one, you know, I've got all the pictures, I've got little bits and pieces of their belongings, and then sure. every night I, I keep a candle burning. Yes. That's all I need to do, because for the, that, we're remembering them, you yes. know. So they're, I mean, yeah, I, I bless them, I talk to them, whatever, but, you know, it's a very simple altar. Right. Um, doesn't have to be elaborate for ancestors. Mine has just like a cup of water on it, you know, like it's very simple. <laughs> well, actually, I had, this is funny, but um, my grandfather used to have a, a shot every night before dinner, a schnapps, oh. he would call it, you know. And so I thought, oh, it was Father's Day and on the ancestor altar, and the ancestor altar was right by my desk. And I thought, oh, I'm going to put a little shot glass up there and I'm going to put a little bourbon in there. So he knows that, you know, it's particularly for him. It's Father's Day. Well, it was warm in here. I'm in California. And and here I have that that shot glass full of whiskey. And all it was doing was like floating in the air. And it (laughs) gave me such a headache. I had to take it down. And, and, you know, you put it there and I'm thinking, well, he's so happy about it. And I had to move it, and I'm going, Grandpa, sorry, I have to move this. I just can't sit here and smell that. It smells nice, but I can't do it. But, 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 okay, so talk about, for a second, about somebody sitting down. They've got the black feather altar done. Yes. What? So, yeah, then- give them an idea. Absolutely. So the the book, if you choose to engage with it as a training course, takes you through this entire process. So we build the altar and we set it up. And then every chapter is a class and that class is contained within a ritual. And that ritual begins at least at the Black Feather Altar. So there is the opening of a ritual, you cast a circle, um, and then you engage with your course of study. Uh, the other thing that happens at your Black Feather Altar is some, so it is your daily self blessing. We teach self blessing, then grounding, and then shielding all as one sort of movement of energy. Uh, it's presented separately in the beginning, but then, you know, the way we prefer it to be done is that that is one, <laughs> one pattern. So then we have, we've instilled a whole lot of love in ourselves, we've grounded and centered, and we've protected ourselves for the day. We encourage that part of the practice to be done before you leave the house. Um, or if you, you know, if you live in a bit of a sort of a, a conflict laden situation, perhaps before you leave your room. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that goes, it goes in that That's direction. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. And I noticed that, that the, every chapter starts with sit in front of your altar, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, exactly. and then it's not a chore. You know, some people think, oh my God, you know, that, blah, blah. but if you get, into it the first two or three times you will just directly go there and do what you need to do you know yes. it's part of part of your day part of your, your magic and it so it just becomes another another thing that is a regular part of your life i think mm-hmm. one of the big things part of why we teach contained in a ritual is that I've observed that many adult pagans that come into my life are uncomfortable in ritual spaces because they just don't engage in a lot of ritual. And I'm very comfortable in ritual spaces, but it's because of the nature of the teaching that I've done for so many years. I'm not good at ritual because I somehow like had magical software installed in me when I first arrived on the planet. (laughs) It's because I practice a lot. So I wanted to get everyone practicing right away. We're going to cast a 
circle. Every time we engage, you know, when this class was running in person, when Black Feather is running, you know, in, in shared linear time, mm-hmm. you know, we meet twice a month. So this is a twice a month ritual. And then on top of that, of course, you have all of your high holidays. So if you engage with all of that, by the end of the year, you're really comfortable in ritual space. And that's what we're going for. Yeah. And it's, it's just not scary people it's exactly. not it's, it's, it's not just, it's lovely <laughs> yeah i mean it's very cathartic too so you know it, it's something we all should do more often um Agreed. but we right now we need to take a quick break and after we get back uh we'll delve a little bit deeper into the book so everybody don't go away and we'll be back in about two minutes don't go away there's more stirring the cauldron with marla brooks right after these important messages it's that time of year again, me pagan and witchy folks. The time for Witches Fest USA, a pagan fair where we all gather dressed as all the magical folks we love, like fays, elves, sprites, and more, with magical vendors, enchanting performers, and magical presenters of all kinds, paths, and traditions. After the opening ceremony on July the 14th, the fair runs from July 15th to the 17th, and on Saturday, July 16th, you can come in person and spend the day on Astor Place in New York City and enjoy free workshops, then presenters, a DJ, and live performances. Friday and Sunday will be live streaming online on the world stage for all to participate. There are over 95 occult workshops to choose from in real time or view them on demand at your convenience. For information and registration, go to www.witchesfestusa.org. That's www.witchesfestusa.org. Get caught up in the magic and enjoy. Are you haunted by shadow people in the middle of the night? Do you secretly love all things creepy and spooky, enjoying ghost stories and horror fiction from the best storytellers? Do you have a true ghost experience you want to share, but no one will believe you? If yes, listen to the professionals on What Are You Afraid of? Horror Paranormal Show, Friday nights at 9 p.m. on ParaX Radio and at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com. What are you afraid of on ParaX? Our creepy and demented hosts are on call to provide you with all your spooky needs with true ghost stories, interviews, indie music, and new horror fiction. We are ready to scare you. Para X. Welcome back to Stirring the Cauldron. Once again, here's your host, Marla Brooks. And my guest tonight is Irene Glass, and we're talking about her new book, Magpie Training, from from the Black Feather Mystery School. Um, You know, there's so many chapters in this book I'm dying to talk about, like magical self-defense, the language of spirit, temple arts, energy basics. I could go on for an hour, but I'm going to whittle it down to maybe just a couple. And the first one I want to talk about, because it jumped up at me, um, is the labyrinth. Now, I have a labyrinth card in my Witch's Oracle deck, and its meaning, is I, the way I read it, is a metaphor for the journey of walking the labyrinth to the center of our deepest self and then back out into the world with kind of a heightened understanding um, of who we are. So what about your labyrinth? Let's talk about that. Yes, so labyrinth walking and the use of finger labyrinths, the ones where you can just use a stylus Mm -hmm. or your index finger to trace the path, is a huge part of my own spiritual practice. So, of course, I knew I needed to include it in magpie training. So... I got into labyrinths about 13 years ago. I went to the Earth Spirit Twilight Covening Retreat, and the way that retreat works, people are uh, divided into groups of about, you know, 8 to 12 or so, and that group is called a clan, and they have a specific area of work, and I did a labyrinth clan. The description of the clan basically promised that it would get me unstuck, and at that point in my life, I was feeling very stuck and very disconnected. And wouldn't you know it, Marla, four days later, I was unstuck. I mean, <laughs> it, was, it was impressive. <laughs> Labyrinths are amazing. They are one of the oldest shared symbols of spirit we have in that we see labyrinths from cultures all over the world. They always occur in places that are considered sacred. We don't always completely know how they were used. However, the really big ones, obviously, we can walk. 
And when we do, many times that process of going into center and then back out again, it's deeply profound, particularly if you step in with intention. Um, the congregation that I belong to, the reason I am a part of it is I came back from that retreat and I hopped on the Worldwide Labyrinth locator to find a walkable labyrinth, found that place, and now that place, of course, is where I teach Black Feather from. So mm-hmm. the power and the gravitational pull of a labyrinth is strong. To this day, I facilitate Full Moon Labyrinth walks every month at the congregation. We do outdoor ones during the summer with drumming and dancing and then indoor ones on a canvas labyrinth during the cooler part of the year. Um, labyrinths are wonderful for long tor- like long-term self-work. Um, I wanted to develop more compassion. I come from a family that can be a little bit like Vulcan. <laughs> They're very logical. <laughs> so, And I... I when I was younger, I found that I didn't like the fact that many of my thoughts were quite judgmental. I wanted to be able to meet people where they were. I have been called to ministry my entire life, and I wanted to basically soften my edges. And over the course of a decade, and specifically working the thread of compassion through labyrinth work, I've been com- very successful. My sister jokingly refers to it as me turning myself into someone who is emotionally porous. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, like so, I know. <laughs> Um, but they are wonderful tools for self-discovery, for communication with our gods, for, oh gosh, working through things, releasing stuff, and then having that moment at the center when you are at the center of yourself and at the center of the labyrinth, you can communicate so clearly. This is where I still get most of the directives from the, the powers that I work with, you know, like I, I can do journey work in my own home and that is effective, but walking a labyrinth and really spending the energy and effort to get in there into the center, it, it does something. I believe there's a reason that this symbol appears across the world in many different cultures. When you're looking at something that is common, regardless of what part of the world we're talking about, you're looking at a piece of the deepest part of human reality, and labyrinths are are part of that tapestry. Yeah, I think it, it's really important. Every time I draw that card, um, it just kind of reminds me again. You yes. know, sometimes maybe you need a walk and you don't take it, and, and it kind of gets you grounded a little bit more. Agreed. Um, I want to mention also that the chapters contain exercises, rituals, guided meditations, and right. each chapter chapter has homework. So this isn't a book that you're going to sit down and read and take it in. It's hands-on. Yes. And there are some... You know, some sort of, um, when they have some visual visualization exercises, um, it's written in the book, but you also have some pre-recorded ones that people can find on your website, right? That's right. So... I'm a recording artist, which means I have a studio in my house. (laughs) So we thought it would be wonderful to just go ahead and actually have recordings of all of the guided meditations that are in the book available for download. They're completely free. If you go to blackfeathermystery.com and visit the tools page, there's links to all of it. Uh, It's hosted on SoundCloud. Everything can be downloaded to your phone. That way you can access those meditations. I know for me, I really love doing guided meditations. Mm -hmm when I'm not the one kind of keeping me on track, if that makes sense. Like I would rather not, I would rather just be able to engage with the experience than to also have to hold the narrative. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to offer that to my students. And and it's also the way Black Feather in person works, right? If we're doing a journey piece, I'm reading it to you. So Mm -hmm. we wanted to have that available to everyone. Along with the guided tracks, there are also just straight up drumming tracks for journey work, for spirit work. The oh. Five minutes, 10 minutes, 15, 20. That way you've got a really nice, solid, stable track uh, at the correct BPM so that you can really engage with that part of your brain. That's amazing. And, you know, and I always, every time I would read a guided um, thing, I would think, how can I be doing this? reading it when I'm supposed to be listening to it or reciting it, you know? Right, I mean, exactly. It, it, they're all in the book, but what you're not going to mention, I mean, some of them are two, three pages long. You nice. can't memorize that and then start to try to remember it while you're in the middle. Of it. it just never makes sense. And when I saw that, I, I grinned. I was happy um, <laughs> <laughs> because you thought about something that was really, really important. And also, um, I found... Another uh, a wonderful exercise from the book 
on your uh, Mystery School YouTube channel, and that yes. is the uh, meeting of the genius loci, right? Yes. We realized that when we tried to describe that one in writing, it's a little difficult. We thought it would be much easier for people to understand what we wanted them to do if they could see Kane actually doing the movements that mm-hmm. help open that connection point between you and the land around you. Mm-hmm. So we thought a video would be the most helpful there. Well, also, now that you mentioned Kane, why don't you introduce him verbally to everybody? Absolutely, I'd love to. So, Kane Dreamwalker is my partner in crime. He is also the didgeridoo player and another vocalist in Kindred Crow. And uh, when I started talking about the Mystery School, uh, after that that big vision of it came to me, I was talking about the fact that I really wanted to teach spirit work, but I cross-trained into spirit work fairly late, which means I know the advanced stuff, but I don't know beginning spirit work. I never had to do that. If you're a good witch, you can skip a lot of the introductory stuff in other paths and just go straight into the really meaty stuff because you have skills that cross over very well, right? Mm -hmm. Kane, on the other hand, has been spirit work from day one. He practices primal spirit work. That is his main path, and he's a wonderful teacher. Um, And so he volunteered immediately. He said, well, I can teach that part and 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 so the story goes uh kane's amazing he's uh you know a sworn dedicant of the morrigan we have some similar things in our backgrounds in that you know i come from the military kane used to be a guard in a prison uh both of us have gone through some pretty rough dark nights of the soul but it makes us into better teachers and better listeners um and he is now a massage therapist he's basically dedicated his entire life to the healing arts wow wow yeah great guy yeah, and, and it, it's really interesting to watch it. So, you know, I encourage people to go over there and cause, cause explain what what it's all about. Sure. Mm. So um, when you're meeting the genius Loki, uh, we, this is referred to as the sort of the over spirit of the land, sometimes the lord of the land. And within Black Feather Mystery School, of course, we want you to begin co-creating relationships with the spirits around you. So that entire process involves going and actually sitting out as close to the earth as you can get, opening a connection point, and then exchanging energy with the genius Loki there. It's a really beautiful practice. Um, I will tell you something I don't tell many people. Uh, When Kindred Crow does shows, if we are in a location where we're going to be for a few days, like if we're playing a festival, we just played um, Free Spirit Gathering and then New York Fairy Festival, mm-hmm. we'll all step off to the side and do this together as a group. Mm. And it helps us bond with the spirits of place. We're huge on honoring the land spirits. And we feel that as performers, it helps us feel more rooted and grounded in mm-hmm. the space where we are if we've had a chance to introduce ourselves and share some gifting with the Lord of the Land. Yeah, and, and watching this, if, you, if people go in and, and get the YouTube channel and watch it, it is so enthralling. I mean, you, you just feel it while you're watching it, and it, it's, it's really beautiful. So, oh, yeah. So but, glad. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to mention that because I think that that's important. Um, I'm going to kind of jump around here and there with sure. things um, because I'd like to talk about guising. Um, yes. What is it, and what are some of the uses in witchcraft? Absolutely. So, guising is a step on the journey to transpossessory work. When we guise, we are taking on an energetic aspect that then causes us to hold our bodies differently. So, one of my favorite examples is working with the elements. Uh, many of us within our practices work with, you know, fire or earth or water elementals. And when mm-hmm. we talk about elementals, of course, we're talking about the sort of the smaller emissaries from the realm. Many of us also will work with the over spirit, right? Big fire. But most witchcraft is done with small fire, right? It's the it's yeah. the uh, the smaller individual spirits. Mm-hmm. So you can share your body, you know, consciously with this spirit and connect to it, and still be in the driver's seat. This is all done with your consent, and you are still in control. But it allows you to then inhabit that identity a little bit, and it's mm-hmm. a really 
wonderful technique. It can be a great step on the way to aspecting, um, a wonderful step on the way to transpossessory work, and of course to shape-shifting. It's like the first rung in the ladder. And it is a very profound experience as well. So when we guise, when we step into the identity of something, we can feel how we are like it. So um, one of the constructs that students in magpie training work with is their empowered witch self. Who you would be as a witch if nothing was in your way, including you. Right. And so we, we see this construct, we work with it, that version of self a lot. And at the end of the book, we have you guys as it. So you can then feel how that self works with you, you know, with your mm-hmm. everyday self. It's a it's a wonderful technique. Um, it's one that I learned from uh, Moira Ashley and Duncan Eagleson uh, out of the Earth Spirit community. Um, it is also if you do a group ritual and you are um, portraying something, uh, if you are, you know, say that you're representing Earth, it allows you to do so so much better. Um, and remember, most of us are in some sort of a guise all the time, like the the face mm-hmm. that you wear at work is not the face that you wear at home, is not the face mm-hmm. that you wear with your parents or with your children. These mm-hmm. are all guises. The practice of guising just takes that and really turns the volume up on it and taps into the true power of how that particular technique can increase and enhance your magic and ritual work. Mm-hmm. I just got a message in the chat room. Um, she said, guising, it's a nice thought. She said, I always thought guising fire made me walk like a samurai, though I didn't know the term. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can make your body do very interesting things. One of the things that we talk about in the book is sort of as we're working up to the first guising exercise is like, also, by the way, you're going to be a little sore after this. <laughs> Just because, like, I remember um, I was in a, a guising group and we were uh, trying to turn people into things that they're not. So you were working with a partner that would then sculpt you. And I was working with a partner, you know, I'm kind of a softy and I'm, you know, a little bit of a mother goose type. And he turned me into a monster, right? So he moved my arm up so that they were curving over like I had claws and so I was kind of you know when I started to move in that guise and feel how it flowed it was this crouching sort of wolf-like movement and coming out of that my quads were on fire Marla it was a mess <laughs> all those <laughs> really muscles cool you never used uh-huh. yeah, exactly <laughs> oh, like you don't funny. normally hold your body that way <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Well, it was good for you. Um, it was. <laughs> and, and in the guising chapter, I mean, you have um, a mirroring exercise, a shaping exercise, a guising exercise. Um, you talk about grounding and centering. Um, yes, you know, I mean, after guising. Yeah. And so, um, all right, you talked earlier about the mirror um, yeah. at the altar. Is the mirroring exercise in guising the same thing that you're doing? It is not. So mirroring is one of – in mirroring as presented within the guising chapter is working with a partner and imitating their movements. Basically, as we work a student up to guising, we want to get – people in the habit of moving of, of allowing their bodies and their energy pattern to be a little looser right so mm-hmm. one a great way to do that is to stand across from someone and then match your breathing to theirs and then one of you starts to slowly move and then the other one imitates it and if oh. you do this exercise well many times you'll lose track of who's initiating the movement you'll just be slowly moving together oh wow and it's a nice step along the pathway to full guising so you know we start with that and then we we work our way up gently we don't just throw people in the the deep end of the swimming pool right away (laughs) (laughs) take it easy and fun uh yeah (laughs) um uh, okay one other thing because i'm going to try and sneak a whole bunch of stuff in here let's talk (laughs) just a second about um devotional witchcraft um i think that's really important Absolutely. Uh, I can only teach the witchcraft that I know, and I am a theistic pagan, which means I have very strong relationships with deities. And we wanted to really get people a good skill set around devotional witchcraft, around witchcraft that works in conjunction with spirits uh, with whom you're in a a co-creative relationship. So if you are, you know, working with Hecate, this chapter gives you some really good skill sets around devotional witchcraft. It Mm -hmm. also talks about 
how to protect yourself from powers that be. So, you know, being able to run an entire mystical encounter through your logic circuits, that you have the power to say no. Like, you know, we want people to feel empowered even when we are in relationship with a being that is a higher energetic class than we are. Mm -hmm. I just read something, a quote today, and it said, saying no is a spell. It is one of the best and most <laughs> profound ones, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I read that and I thought, yeah, that, that's really good. Yeah. Um, for me, I, I, witchcraft doesn't work without faith. I know for some other people it does, but the form that Cain and I teach both involves the gods. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I think we need to be in touch with them, you know. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, who you pray to, but there, there has to be somebody there. Yes. Um, what about the, the primal spirit? Yes. So within all of us, I saw this concept, I think, first presented by Starhawk years and years ago in Spiral Dance. She talks about sloth woman, right? Mm -hmm. That there's a being inside of us that doesn't use uh, flowery language. She responds to drum beats, to rhythm, to, you know, to the wildness inside of us. And, and the primal spirit is that, that being. It is what lives inside of all of us, who we are down at our, our deepest core. If we pull away all of the civilizing factors and all of the pieces of ourselves that we've cut off in order to fit in, and all of the impulses that we push down into the floor, this is our primal self. And by connecting back with that, we have this wonderful energy source, and we can begin to heal some of the wounds as well. You know, many of the edits that we've made to ourselves over the years, we didn't need to, you know, they were part of perhaps a, the culture that we grew up in or a family structure that wasn't the healthiest. By connecting to our primal selves, we really begin to realign to who we truly are down at our core. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's so many, so many important chapters here that things that, that you don't think about or maybe take for granted or don't know about. Um, and, and, you know, like the language of spirit, I mean, people think, okay, it is, it is, but you've got, you start out with the rules. Now yes. people are going to say, rules, spirit, rules, you want to, you want to <laughs> answer that for yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that one person scratching their head trying to figure it out. Like, what on earth are you talking about? <laughs> rules, oh my God. Yes, rules, or at least guidelines, right? I can only teach what I know. <laughs> So we'll bear that in mind. But yeah. when we are talking about ritual language and ritual arts, there are rules, there are guidelines that make this more effective. So when we are, you know, uh, when we are connecting with spirit, we, we want to see the way a child does because we carry so many preconceived notions inside of us. You know, we want to be naturalists. We really want to connect to what is and to be curious about the natural world you know we want to take trips regularly into nature like all of these are in the rules um one other good thing to you know to take from it one of the rules is be quiet when you're out in nature <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, I was just listening to npr i think earlier today and they were talking about the fact that literally human noise causes harm to some bird species mm. because it interrupts their ability to read their own environment when when you're out in nature, go quietly. You'll have many more wonderful interactions that way. You know, if you're out having a loud conversation or whatever, you will chase off the spirits that would otherwise connect with you. So there are absolutely, maybe not rules again, but good guidelines for having more transcendental and mystical experiences with other spirits and healthier ones, longer ones, deeper ones. Well, also in that, you talk about playtime. You want to go into yeah. that a little bit? That sounds Absolutely. fun. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah. So literally go out, just go outside. <laughs> I think it's how playtime can best. Go outside and try to have beginner's mind. I think, you know, I'm over 40 now. It's really easy to get into a I have seen it all mindset. We get a little mm -hmm. jaded and tired and cynical. And, I, you know, it's it's no one's fault, right? We do live mm -hmm. in a very challenging timeline right now. We do. But try to shed that to remember who you were when you were six years old and the woods were full of magic because they still are. But we have to allow our imagination to engage again. We have to give ourselves a chance to have that experience. So really just, you know, we teach some observational skills and then 
the way that class works in person is we literally throw the students out <laughs> onto the seven acres that surround the congregation and go, go play, go have experiences, go look at, the, talk to the trees, go down to the stream, you know, go over to where the beehives are, like connect. And whatever your outside is, obviously, you know, I live in the mid-Atlantic, so we are, you know, it's sort of an agricultural region. This is going to be different out in Arizona, in the desert or in California where you are, but there are spirits everywhere. So you can absolutely, by just going outside to play and having no expectations around it, I'm just going to go outside, I'm going to have some fun. That is when some of the most profound experiences occur. It's when we let go of trying to control a situation and just allow it to happen. That's so important. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got so many topics to talk about and so little time, but I want to just tell them real quickly, and then I'm going to throw it at you. Um, I, I was, you know, poking around YouTube and, you know, whatever. And I just want people to mention that, and I said that you're a yoga instructor um, yes. in the opener, but there are lots and lots of videos that yes. people can watch on your YouTube channel. That's right. So during the plague, my yoga classes went online and I was using Zoom anyway, so I just recorded them all and uploaded them. They're all there. They're free. Uh, there's a huge collection for ad advancing beginner series. Basically, if you can take tabletop and low lunge and warrior pose, those classes are very accessible. Um, please take them. Enjoy. You know, that this mm -hmm. is one of the silver linings that came out of the pandemic. Uh, I really want people to feel embodied. Um, it's a huge part of my own magic. This mm -hmm. is part of why we encourage the use of dance and, um, you know, dedicated time for movement within black feather if yoga works for you give it a try and if you'd like to have yoga taught to you by a witch <laughs> come to my youtube channel <laughs> there you go i mean it was just you know i i you've got so many hats that you're wearing and you're still sane <laughs> i'm i'm really pleased about hearing that uh, Thank you. <laughs> on your website um People will find out a lot about you. They'll find out about Black Feather Mystery School. Um, you also offer musings and conversations um, on your blog. That's right. um, you do readings. You do healings. You do pastoral counseling services, magical and ritual work, uh, guided study. And now I'm going to take a deep breath. And... Uh, <laughs> And more, you know, both in person and remotely. So, um, yeah, where can people go to find it all? Sure thing. For me specifically, it's glasswitchcottage.com, and glass is spelled with an E, so G-L-A-S-S-E. Uh, my Gaelic ancestors gave me a silent E. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, glasswitchcottage.com has basically everything that I personally offer. So there are links to recordings there. I write a weekly or almost weekly blog. I'm, you know, I'm one of the uh, clergy folk that writes a regular column in my local newspaper. So there's a lot of content. Uh, I've been writing the blog weekly for, I think, three or four years now. So if you use the search function and look up, say, protection magic, you will pull up several articles. It's just a useful resource at this point in time. Um, on top of that, of course, I, I do work as a witch basically full time. So I do offer tarot readings. I can do these uh, via distance. Um, I do pastoral counseling. I am trained in that. Uh, so there are a lot of different ways to connect, and all of that is on glasswitchcottage.com. For the school specifically and the tools associated with it, blackfeathermystery.com. And, uh, you know, Kane's and my plan is to basically keep those both, both of those websites up forever, so they are always available to you. <laughs> they should be. And uh, so thank you for that. And I want to thank you for being with us tonight. Um, it's amazing. It's a really good book. The whole concept is wonderful. And um, like I, I sometimes say, you know, one of your chapters could be a whole show. So down the line, think about maybe if you want to come on and do a whole show on one of your chapters. I would love that. Thank you so much for having me, Marla. This has been such a pleasure. Oh, thank you. And let's always also thank everybody that's listening, both live and right now. And um, so, yeah. The podcast, too. <laughs> podcast all over the place. Tomorrow, Yay! they'll be out there. In case you Thank want to hear Thank you so much for listening, everyone. <laughs> if you're going to hear it again, you know, you want, if you think you missed something, go to the podcast and it's in a million <laughs> different places. Anyway, until next time, everybody, blessed be and merry meet again. Good night.
This has been another edition of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Be sure to tune in next week at the same time for another great guest and more fun. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2009. You have been listening to the Para-X Radio Network. 